2, a project the Nazis approved for reasons of their own. After the war, the museum was placed under national administration and in 1950 it was nationalised. In 1994, the museum's buildings were returned to the Prague Jewish community and the bulk of its collections returned by the state to the Federation of Jewish Communities in the Czech Republic. On the 1st of October 1994, the museum regained its independence from the state, marking the start of a new chapter in its more than 100-year history. It is from this premise that Dr. Suzanne, Susanna Pavlovska, his lecture is based. But a little bit about who is Susanna. In 2011, Dr. Susanna Pavlovska became the head of the Department for Education and Culture of the Jewish Museum in Prague, and since 2021, also the Deputy Director. The department collaborates with leading universities and educational institutions, including the Theresen Memorial, the Institute for Contemporary History at the Czech Academy of Sciences, Charles University in Prague, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, sorry, can we just switch off our cell phones, please? And the Yad Vashem Memorial. She also works closely with independent historians, experts in Jewish studies, literary scholars, scientists, and teachers. Susanna is involved in several educational projects. These include the hugely successful Neighbors Who Disappeared, and in cooperation with the Theresen Initiative Institute, Ours or Foreign, Jews in the Czech 20th Century. Susanna lectured at the Charles University in Jewish Studies and Modern Hebrew. She collaborates with various Holocaust centers around the world where she has presented numerous lectures, um, including Beit Theresen in Israel, the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center, as well as our sister centers in Johannesburg and Durban. For somebody who looks so young, it's quite remarkable what she's achieved. Susanna studied at the Charles University in Prague and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. In 2019, she finished her PhD studies and wrote a thesis dedicated to the role of women in the Haskalah. Currently, she is representing the Czech Republic within, the, within IRA, which is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, and in 2020 is the chair of the education and in 2020 was the chair of the educational working group it gives me great pleasure to call on susanna Thank you so much, Edo. I really moved. It's very nice that how nice you introduced me. And good evening to all of you here, ladies and gentlemen. To all of you, you are in front of the screen. It's really my pleasure to be here. And like I said yesterday when I did the lecture also, it's after one and a half year, the first trip abroad, far away from my country, from Prague to Cape Town. And I'm so glad that I can have the speech here and talk about the Jewish Museum in Prague. And I'm also happy for you, came that you can see the exhibition, which is all around here. I will start with the history of the Jewish Museum in Prague. We already heard that the Jewish Museum in Prague is one of the oldest Jewish museums in Europe. The Jewish Museum in Prague was founded in 1960 6, 1906 as the third oldest Jewish museum in Central Europe after Vienna and Frankfurt. The reason why the Jewish museum was actually founded in 1906, it's a little bit complicated. I have to go back to the history, which means that I would like to mention a few important things. Some of you maybe visited Prague and you know that the former Jewish quarter is located in such a small area of the old town 
and it used to be a ghetto for Jews from the 13 to the 1800. In the 1800, the son of Maria Theresia, Joseph II, decided to open literally the gates of the ghetto and Jews got the chance to leave. Some of them left and they started to live in different parts of Prague. Some of them stayed because they didn't want to leave the place which was connected with the shoes and everything was there. But the mayor of the city Prague decided that it will be nice to actually build a new part of Prague on the same area and they decided to destroy the former Jewish quarter. So you can see actually some of the buildings from 1893, how the Jewish quarter looked like. And I will show you actually more. And actually many Jews were against it. There were so many demonstrations. They didn't want to destroy the quarter, but the mayor said, okay, we have to build a new part of the town. The same they did already in Vienna, in France, in Hungary, we will do the same. So actually the reason why the Jewish Museum was founded in 1906 was to preserve what was actually left and to keep the memory for the future. You can see also such a set picture because on the right side you can see the former gypsy synagogue it's also interesting the name of the gypsy synagogue it was founded by the Salomon Sigoiner which is in English gypsy so he just used his name for this shul and you can see the members of the synagogue just staying in front of the shul because they didn't want to destroy the shul they used to go to we can also used today the old paper model that this is how the Jewish quarter looked like before 1900. This is such an incredible work which was done in the middle of the 1900 by one guy who worked for the Charles University and when he finished his work he walked through the Jewish quarter and he drew what he saw and then he did this paper model. The paper model is half of this room. It's very huge one and we can really see how the Jewish quarter looked like and we can see all the synagogues which were there at the time. We can read it for here I think. You can see the Tsigoiner, the gypsy synagogue, we just saw the picture. We can see old new synagogue, which is still there. It's the oldest synagogue still in use in Europe from 1250, 1270. You can see the Jewish town hall and the high synagogue still there. The Jewish town hall, it's today the seat of the Prague Jewish community. The high school, the high synagogue is used for the members of the community during the week. You can see the old Jewish cemetery, it's still there. Pinka synagogue, Clausen synagogue is still there. Great Core synagogue was destroyed and other places are not there anymore. So this is something which we are still using till today because when people are coming to Prague, they are so impressed. They are seeing the Old Town Square. They are seeing the Paris Street, which is part of the former Jewish quarter. They are seeing all very beautiful buildings. And it's hard to imagine that this place was used as a ghetto for 500 years. So the guy who was actually responsible for the foundation of the Jewish Museum in Prague was Salomon Hugo Lieben. Salomon Hugo Lieben was actually the first director of the Jewish Museum in Prague in 906. So why people decided to make in Prague, it, the make to do the Jewish Museum in Prague? So there was kind of association for the founding and maintaining of a Jewish Museum in Prague. The main aim was to collect, preserve and exhibit ritual and household items, archive materials, manuscripts, and all printed books on Jewish history from Prague and Czech lands. The main important thing was that they really focus on the original focus and we published the first guidebook in 1926. I have to say when the museum was founded, still the synagogues were used as a working synagogue. So all the synagogues were used till 1941, which means that at the time just one building was used as a museum and they got some of the items and they just made a small exhibition. The oldest item we have is the actually chair for Brit Miller, the chair of the Kiseliahu. So this is our oldest object we got from one community and it's still based in one of our synagogues today. Everything changed when actually uh, the Nazi came to my country. I have to say that the Jewish Museum was kind of like a very small 
museum in Prague till 1949. We didn't have so many items, but still there was something which was to remember the Jewish history in my country, which goes back to the 10th century. When the Nazis came and we were occupied on the 15th of March 1949, all the activities just ended. Everything was put to the end. And it was interesting, uh, the Nazis were very interested in the Jewish property and in all the things we have at the time as a part of our collections. What happened was that, uh, uh, no, I will go back. Uh, what happened was that before the World War II, we used to have 153 Jewish communities. And when the Nazis came to Prague, immediately they said that all the Jewish property from 153 Jewish communities must be sent to Prague, which means that they decided to close the synagogues for the services and all the synagogues started to be used as a storage houses. So all the property from all the synagogues, the Torah scrolls, curtains, all the silver things which are used during the services, Sidurim, Magzurim, everything was sent to Prague. And the Nazis were smart enough to know that uh, just Jewish people will be able to work with it, to recognize what kind of the objects are there. They could read the Hebrew. So they decided to make a group of the people from the Jewish Museum and from the Jewish community, they will have to work for them. So the collections were coming, the people are sitting 24 hours in the room, and they started to make the catalog of the things they were receiving. The catalog we are using till today because this is really something incredible what they were able to do at that time. So the collections were transferred into the care of the Prague Jewish community and they have to start to work with it. You are just seeing these two pictures which uh, reminds me uh, always when I'm looking on it. You can see actually Adolf Hitler, he is looking from the window and he's seeing on the left side the Church of St. Nicholas. He is based in a Prague Castle area. Prague Castle was always the seat of the Czech Kingdom. All the emperors used this place and today the president of the Czech Republic is using this place also. When Hitler came, all the people have to leave and he started to be there just for a few days and you, if you know Prague, if you know the era of Prague Castle, I would try to just make you feel that you know it. Just in between the Prague Castle, it's a big hill called Petrin, and there's a big tower, which is a copy of the Eiffel. And Hitler saw this copy of the Eiffel, and he said, we have to destroy it. It's disturbing the view from Prague Castle. But the day after he left, and no one did it, which is very good for us, because we have the copy of the Eiffel Tower there from 1891. The Central Office for Jewish Emigration was also set up and the main guy who was responsible for everything was the head SS Stumban Führer Hans Ginter and the main interest was Jewish property. We have to get everything what is there. So like I said, they started to send to Prague all the Jewish property from all around and they started first the things from the synagogues and secondly, they started to ask for their own stuff all kind of radios, skis, and other things. We know in the autumn of 1941, the Prague synagogues were closed and converted into war houses for confiscated Jewish property. The main aim, to gather together the collections of the Jewish Museum of Prague and Mikulov, as well as the richer objects from Prague synagogues and other artifacts from the pre-war Jewish communities in Bohemia and Moravia. You can see on the left, side this is the interior of the spanish synagogue the spanish synagogue was used as a storage house for benches from all around the synagogues which were close by later on other stuff you can see the clothes you can see the blankets and you can see the windows of the synagogues everything was full of the stuff and the jews have to work for the nazis to make the things in order because they didn't know what the Nazis would like to do with it. There was kind of idea that maybe they would like to transfer the stuff somewhere. But actually in 1944, when they finished with all these collections, it was too late probably for the Nazis to send the things somewhere or to melt the stuff. So everything actually stayed in Prague. And today, like had already said, we have the biggest collection 
in the world of truss cross curtains syllables it's always hard for us when we are doing a new exhibition to pick something because we have so many things but of course every item each of them has their own story and we are trying to get the story back so we created a new exhibition and always there is a sign of star and you can actually read a little bit more about the object you will recognize that we got it specifically during 1942-44 and you will get the background sometimes we can even figure out who was actually the owner of the object so we are trying to bring back the names of the people they used to use all these things at home inside the synagogues during the services just to make them a little bit more alive you can also see that actually we have the year 1942. It was already a year after when the mass transports actually from my country started. And I spoke a lot today also about the 1941 because we have 2021. So it's 80 years after and we are in the autumn part of the year when everything started because the mass transport started in October and then November. But you can also see that uh, before everything was going on, already first transport left my country to the Nisko, then to the Lodge, then to the Minsk and from 1941 to Terezin. You can see also the numbers of the people they survived the war. We can also see that more than 74,000 people were deported to Theresienstadt and then to the east. If we are looking back to see the numbers of the Jews before 1939, you can see that the population was about 118,310 and the liberation 15,000. I just must say that uh, before the World War II, we were a really big community and many Jews were living inside the country. Few of them survived and when they came back after 1945, many of them decided to leave the country and they left the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Israel. And today we are all together, 5,000 Jews are living in the Czech Republic and 1,360 in Prague Jewish community. So it's really such a low number comparing how rich was the life, the Jewish life before the World War II started. So when the transport started, this is another part of the history of the Jewish Museum because like I said, we started in 1906. We have really few items. Then we got so many items from the collections, but of course, another part of our collections today is the art from Terezin. So you saw some of you yesterday, maybe some of the drawings here in the hall, you can see other and also the poems, everything. This is another part of the history of the Jewish Museum in Prague today, because we got so many things from Theresienstadt. Most of the things were hidden in Theresienstadt and found it right after the liberation. So you can see another poem here written by Hanus Hachenburg and also some of his drawing. Another drawing. This is my favorite one also on the left side. It uh, was made by Dorit Weiser, Dreams of Palestine. I have to say that no one from the Jews before the World War II went to Palestine. They heard the stories, they knew how the country maybe looked like, but they never visited Palestine. And when the kids were in Theresienstadt, the teachers tried to explain and kind of explore in them how maybe Palestine looked like. And we have one part of the children drawings which really deals with the dreams about the Palestine. And the kids tried to make it how they really felt and how they thought that this is the reality. So you can see the palms, you can see actually all the other things which are there but some of the drawings they've also stuff they it's not there but they just thought that it's maybe this is actually palestine the dreamland because many of them dreamt about to go there the other drawing it's actually interesting also because it's a uh, still in Theresienstadt. it's the magdeburg barracks when the kids used to actually lived as a prisoners and always when they went outside for a few hours and they were going back above the main door they saw two horses 
So one child draw the two horses above the main gate. And till today, if you are going there, I'm always seeing the two horses and I always remember the drawing. Also, some of the drawings are connected to the Jewish holidays, so Seder. So, and it was one part. And the other part was also the culture in Terezin or Terezinstadt, because one part of the collections today, what we have in Prague in Jewish Museum, also in Terezin, is the art of the real artists. They were actually prisoner in Terezinstadt. We have, I picked just few to show you how they actually, how amazing are they did under such a bad conditions and horrible, startling stuff, whatever. Karl Fleischmann was born in 1897, perished in 1944 in Auschwitz. And this is one of his drawing he actually did in Trazin. There is also other one, Bedrich Fritta. He died 1944. And he actually, it's made, it's very famous what he did for his son. When he was in Trezin, his son had a birthday. He was three years old. And he decided to make for him a book. And there's written Tomichkovi, it's Thomas, to his first birthday, Trezin, 22nd of January, 1944. And I have to say that when I'm seeing the drawings and I'm seeing the book, it's always very, very sad because just to imagine that the dad was preparing a book for his son for his birthday, he didn't know if they will survive and he didn't know if he will see Tom as a man and boy. So he decided that he will make him some kind of a book for future. So there are all kind of the little marks, maybe when you will get older, you will be auto mechanical. Maybe you will be a pilot. Maybe you will be this and that. One day you will get married. Maybe your wife will have a blonde hair, brown hair, whatever. And it's so sad in the way that we know that the dad didn't survive. Tommy actually survived. And later on, when he was 18, he got the book from his father. And he saw how actually the father was preparing him for the future. And today this is also something that it's part of our collections and we are using it a lot to teach about this part of the history. The other one who was also very famous, it's Hans Krasa. Hans Krasa was the one who actually uh, made uh, the children opera, who wrote the music for the children opera Brundibar. It was 54 performances in Terzinstadt during the World War II. And in the middle, you can see actually the poster, how they were trying to invite people to hear Brundi Bar in Terzinstadt. And someone also made the auto portrait of Hans Krasa. And I think it's t now time that you can actually hear a little bit of Brundi Bar. We have this uh, from the propaganda movie, which was actually made when the International Red Cross Committee came to visit Terezinstadt. And then they wrote the report that it's so nice there and Jews are going well there. It doesn't, they don't need to go to visit Auschwitz-Birkenau and others. So this is actually something which was founded 20 years after the liberation of Terezin in 1965. And today we have kind of like document that you can hear pieces of the 
bring your children opera together with the real art. We know that actually it was really unique that people were, and it's really amazing that people were able to de- do the art, to do the music, to play the theater, to make the cabaret and other things under such a hard conditions. And they always were afraid of the transports to the East. Most of the artists went later on, were sent to the dead actually camps uh, in Auschwitz-Birkenau, Treblinka, Trostinets, and other places, some of them also Bergen-Belsen, Sachsenhausen, and others. So see, here's just a map where we can see where they were deported. What is very strange, on one way, Jews were deported to the concentration and extermination camps. On the other hand, some of them were kept in Prague to make the collections, and even they have to make and prepare the exhibitions in the former synagogues for the SS commanders, they were coming to Prague. So the synagogues were used during the World War II already as a museum. So the ceremony hall of the Bruce Society, which was built in 1911, there was an exhibition about the Prague Ghetto Museum. The Klaus Synagogue, there was an exhibition about the Jewish traditions and life cycle. Old New Synagogue, I um, must say again, the oldest synagogue still in use for their services. There is a history of the synagogue, and in the middle of the bima, where you have the shulchan, the table to, for the reading from the Torah scroll, there is a figure of the Jews with the talis, with the tefillin, and to pretend that he is reading from the Torah scroll, even he got the yat in his hand. High synagogue, there was the book museum, all the manuscripts were there. Pinka synagogue, there were the technical facilities and Spanish and Jerusalem synagogue were used as a warehouses. So for me till today, it's unbelievable that they have to prepare exhibitions about these topics for the SS commanders. And there were so many visits from Germany, Austria and other places. And they always went to see the exhibitions in the former synagogues. And of course, if they saw something which was interesting for them, they just took it with them. So that's why some of the things are still somewhere around and we are trying, of course, as much as we can to get the things back to us, to the Jewish Museum, because all the things, they got kind of like a number so we can really recognize them till today. The lady on the picture is actually the second director of the Jewish Museum in Prague. She was a wonderful lady. Her name was Hanna Volavkova. She also survived. She actually used to be a member of the stuff they have to make the collections. So she was like from 1942 till 1944 in Prague and she worked on all these collections. And later on, she was deported to Theresienstadt and she was liberated there. Right after the liberation, she came to Prague and she started actually to be the director of the Jewish Museum in Prague. And she started to see what is there and she knew the collections by heart and thanks to her we have everything till today because she did such a big job because she saved everything and she said okay we have to remember all the people we have to remember everything but we have to start to work and we will open a jewish museum because like i said 10,500 people mostly went back and the reality was that the jewish community saw that it's not possible to open again the 154 Jewish communities. And they fought maybe 50, but at the end it was less and less, and now we have 10 communities. So the property was actually in Prague, and they couldn't send it back to the communities but because they were no Jews anymore. That's why everything really stayed in Prague. And I um, just must say, when people were coming back, the return was not so welcome for them. That's why many of the people felt that this is not their homeland anymore and they just wanted to leave because they were alone. The people were not interested in their stories. Uh, there was such a big fights between them because of the property, because people were using their houses and flats and everything. And I think Franta Kohn, who survived Terzin, Auschwitz, Grossgrossen and Dachau after the return, just really her his words they don't i don't have to comment them everything looked the same as before prague wasn't bombed everything was on its place just people i knew were missing and 
it's another part of the history. Prague wasn't bombed, which is very nice today that everything what is there is really from the time when the buildings were built. You can see the Charles Bridge on the left side. The bridge was there, the river was there, everything the same. It was May, nice weather, but he was just sitting on the bench and he just felt like that. And later on, he also escaped to Israel because he just said like, this is not my home anymore. I think for the people, they were coming back from the extermination camps and they survived really horrific things. They thought that maybe they will be able to start life somehow in different countries. And some of them, they said, OK, I will stay in this country and I will try to start to live as a normal human being. But no one was expected that in 1948, the communists will take the power and everything will be the same. That's why I'm sometimes thinking thinking about all the people they survive and they went through such a bad things and they really expected that something will change because you know it was something that no one from us can actually imagine. But in 1948, uh, the communists took the power and the state started to be again under the control and Jews started to be again no welcome in the countries. The thing was also, of course, connected with the state of Israel. When the state of Israel was founded in 1948, Czechoslovakia was one of the countries that voted for state of the Israel. And we supported a lot Israel with the uh, guns and uh, all the other things. But of course, Stalin maybe thought that Israel will go on the side of the Soviet Union, but it didn't happen. And from one night, we were the supporter. The other night, we were actually the enemy. So all the people, they stayed in the former Czechoslovakia and they were Jews. They started to be really afraid because they started to change their names, the surnames, because they said, OK, if I will change my name from the Jewish name to the normal, like a Czech name, uh, maybe they will not know that I'm Jew, but it was really wrong. They could really figure out who is Jewish and who is not again. The other thing is, of course, when they decided maybe it's good to leave, it was too late because they couldn't leave. And they started really to be very kind of like a stress and they tried to hide their identity and they mostly the children of the survivors didn't know that they are Jewish, which is another part of the history in my country. So that's why it was really very complicated and that's why we are probably today such a small community. So the Jewish Museum, like had already said, became a state museum in 1950. In May 1945, the Jewish Museum renewed its activities under the Czechoslovak Council of Jewish Communities, and later on, it became again a state Jewish Museum. The museum's collections had become more than a hundred times larger as a result of shipments of material from the 154 pre-war Jewish communities. You can see some of our objects, the shield for the Torah scroll, the beautiful Hanukkah menorah, the actually back of the Hebra Kadisha, and the special ring for wedding with the little household. Of course, what was pretty interesting was that the communists in the beginning thought that maybe it will be very good to sell everything because someone will actually buy it from us. Later on, someone probably convinced them that this is not a good idea, it's good to keep the collection together. And of course, the members of the Jewish Museum started to work there and they started to work with all these collections. Of course, what happened was also a new department was created to document wartime persecution and Jewish monuments outside Prague. Return, this is also important, that returning private property to its rightful owners continued to the end of 1949. But there was not so many people, they asked for something because most of them just disappeared. In 1950, the museum was placed under the control of the Minister of Education and became a state institution. Still, the director of the Jewish Museum was Hanna Volavkova, and she said, we have to continue our work like before. We will never give up, and we will just do what we would like to do, and we will try. And she was really, really strong lady, because she said, okay, we have to remember all the people we lost, and we have to start now to put the names on the walls of the Pinka Synagogue, 
The Pinka synagogue was the one which was not used during the World War II. It was the facilities there. It was pretty much destroyed. So first they made the reconstructions of the synagogue inside and they renovated everything. And then she asked two artists, Jiří Jon and Václav Boštík, to think about the memorial of the victims of the Shoah. I have to say that in 1950, we didn't have any databases. We didn't have any books about the victims from my country. The only thing which, which we have was actually the transport list, which were left when the Nazis left Prague, which means they could use all the transport lists and of course the people they murdered, they helped them to say who survived, who didn't. And they tried to make actually the number of the people and the list of the people according to the communities which they used to live before the World War II. So when Hanna Volovka asked these two artists, they decided we will do very simple, but for me it's always very powerful memorial. We will make the list of them according to the communities. So when you are coming today to the Pinka synagogue, it's according to the alphabet system, and you have always the in yellow color the name of the place when they used to live. In the red color is the surname and the beginning of the first name, and dates are in black. Of course, we know the day of birth, but we don't know the exact date of that. That's why at that time in 1950, they decided that they will use the day of the last transport from Protectorate, Bohemia and Moravia, and it's still there like that. So this is the memorial. And uh, in 1954 till 1959, they actually were able to put more than almost 80,000 Jewish victims and names of them of the Shoah from the Czech lands on the walls all around. But before, in 1952, there was the Slansky trial, which means that on one side, the Jewish Museum, State Museum, tried to remember all the victims, tried to do the collections. And on the other side, there was this anti-Semitic trial with members of the par Communist Party. And these people were Jewish. Most of them survived the war. They were, before the World War II, part of the government. They all of them belonged to the Communist Party, but of course Jews were not they, they were not welcome to be members of the Communist Party. And uh, of course the communists got the report from Russia, do something with them. So they really created an anti-Semitic trial and 14 people were executed just because they were Jews. And this was the worst thing which was happening for the people they were outside, they were Jewish, and they started to be much more afraid because they saw that these people, the members of the Communist Party, the powerful people, were killed because they created the anti-Semitic trial, because they were saying that, of course, they are pro-Zionist and they are actually, you know, the people that are doing something next to the communist uh, because they would like to support the state of Israel. I have to say that 14 people were executed on the 3rd of December 1952. The families were at home and f they actually didn't know that the people were killed because they have to write postcards and they were getting the postcards till June 1953. And then they told them they all of them were killed in December 1952. All of them were burned and the ashes was threw on one side on the street. So this was the reality for the Jews in my land. That's why it was very really hard really to say who you are because the people started to be very, very worried and most of them tried to escape from my country. We know that some of them stayed and uh, they started to continue the lives, the museum was working, and the 60s actually uh, was something that people thought that the situation will change. Uh, the exhibition activities increased, and uh, we started to actually have our magazine, the Judaicum Bohemicum, and everything seems to be good. But 1968 come, August 21st, and we were occupied by the Soviet Union by the Russians and other armies. 
and it was a time when some of the Jews left the country because they said we will n- we don't want to stay here anymore. So this was the big wave. The first was 1948, the other was 1968, and uh, the Pinka Synagogue, with the n- names of the victims of the Shoah, was closed till Velvet Revolution. But it was not just closed; they have to erase the names of the victims from the wall. It was not possible to do any research, any publication, nothing. And one of the main persons at the time, Karol Sidon, who became, after the Velvet Revolution, the chief rabbi of the Prague Jewish community, also emigrated first to Germany. He studied in the Heidelberg, the Jewish studies, and then to Israel when he got the smicha to be a rabbi because he was Jewish from the father's side. And also Leo Pavlat, very important person till today. He is the director of the Jewish Museum in Prague from 1994. Uh, he actually was also the dissident who stayed in Prague and who was kind of like a member of the Jewish community and who actually was also persecuted under the communist regime. This is also interesting that uh, there was kind of Operation Spider from 1971. Actually, the STB, which is a state police, was controlling the people. They were kind of like involved in the Jewish community or in the Jewish museum. So this is actually a great picture of my colleague when he was getting, he actually had the wedding. And when he saw after the Velvet Revolution, the picture in the archive of the state police, he said, well, it's amazing. I have a wedding picture from that time. You know, I didn't know that they were so interested that they took the picture of me just in front of the door to go to the Jewish community. But you can see also some of the pictures outside the house, inside the metro. So there was really the people were really controlled by the state police. It's also actually that they were trying of course, to kill all the religion. So not just the Judaism, but also the Christianity. But Jews were much more controlled by the state. You can see the limitation of the religious and cultural life, and it's called the normalization. This is also interesting, just uh, if you know the history from past, and you know some of the caricatures, and you know what the Nazis use, you can just see that it's just the same. Just it's actually written in Russia, and you can see again an like, ugly face, the Jewish star, and all the things which are connected with all the prejudices and stereotypes which were used in the past, but they were used also during the communism time, and sometimes it's really sad we can see that they are used till today. The Velvet Revolution was something really great for all of us because I was born during the communism time, but I was 12 and was uh, the Velvet Revolution and the life changed a lot for me and uh, I think for all the people. We had, we were, I think, very lucky that uh, Václav Havel was the president of uh, the former Czechoslovakia, then Czech Republic, because people were really uh, expecting so many changes and I think they got them. The one thing was that we started to study English also, because before we studied German and Russian. So I started to study English when I was 12. So I hope you can understand me very well now. So it's something really will change a lot. And also it changed the feelings of the identity because people started to be much more open to say who they are, uh, about the roots. We started for the first time to talk about the Shoah. It was not part of the curriculum at all. We studied about the World War II without Jews. We went to see Terezin, it was an army base, the soldiers were there, and no mention about the Jews during the World War II. So the Jewish Museum in Prague started to be again a private museum in 1994. The museum collections returned to the Czech Federation of Jewish Communities. Synagogues and the cemetery were given back to the Prague Jewish community and new, new challenges ahead. We made kind of like agreement with the Jewish community in Prague that we will use the synagogue again as a museum, but we will create a new exhibition with a new story. We will tell the story in a different way. And we just finished last year the new exhibition in the Spanish synagogue, which started in the 1800, goes through the 1900, through to the 20th century, and it's ended up now in 2021 that if you will go to visit it, you will finish with some kind of hope that there is still Jewish life 
in Prague, that we have the school and other things, and we are not ending with the Shoah, because the first exhibition was the end, 1945, and no one knew if they went outside, if there is still community, is there some Jews among us or not. So this is something what we're trying to change still and work on the collections and use as much as we can the items we have because this is really something unique. You can also see the director, Leo Pavlat. He is actually inside the Spanish synagogue, which is one of the really uh, famous and also beautiful synagogues in Prague, built in 1868 in the Moorish design. And it's really, really beautiful. I will show you more pictures. For me, it's very important that two years after the museum started to be again private, uh, some people decided that it's very important to focus on the education and the Department for Education and Culture, which I'm running now, was founded in 1996. We started with all kind of the topics, but of course we are focusing a lot on the history of the Shoah, but today also, how was the return? We have so many travel exhibitions. We are doing like a Sunday schools for kids. We are doing the project Crocus, which is international project that uh, actually kids can buy, kids are actually getting from us bulbs of cr the of the flower and they can do all kind of signs and they are getting them right now. I got a message from my colleagues that they send all the bulbs to all the schools around Prague. They will just put them now into the ground and if the weather will be fine in January, they will go up and the color of yellow all the kids will actually remember what was happening and it's always close to the day of the Holocaust, the 27th of January. We are also using the synagogues for all kinds of culture events. You can see an amazing lady. She is almost 100, but she is amazing till today and with the musicians. And we are also, and I'm set always to see the picture on the right side, the lady in the blue pullover was Hanna Lieblova. She was a survivor and she always went to have the speech to the children and she actually died three years ago and we are missing her a lot because she was also the head of the Terezin Initiative, which is the initiative with uh, the survivors from the former Czechoslovakia. So she was actually a great lady and I'm always happy to have the lectures and just to remember her because she always said that we have to continue when they will be not there anymore with us. So this is just some of the uh, images from the Jewish Museum in Prague. You can see the, actually on the left side, it's uh, the interior, on, it's on the left side, it's actually the Clausen Synagogue, which is just next to the Jewish cemetery. The interior, it's inside. Today we have the, the exhibition of the, like a Jewish life from the childbirth uh, through the kosher kitchen and the holidays. You can also see actually the streets and just like the cemetery, it's interesting because uh, it's the only cemetery in, in Czech Republic that it uh, actually survived completely. It was actually the cemetery from the time when Jews were forced to live in the ghetto and because they couldn't enlarge the ghetto, they have to bury people in the layers. So sometimes you have up to four, uh, ten layers, one above the each other. And there's about 12,000 tomb tombstones still above the main ground and more than 100 people were actually buried there. You can see the ceremony hall which was built in 1911 today we have the exhibition there about the Hebra Kadisha, the Burl Society and you can see some of the beautiful tombstones from the cemetery you can also see actually the Meisel synagogue uh, which was built in 1592 we have there also a new exhibition about the history of the Jews from the beginning which means from the 10th century till the end of uh, 1800 when Maria Theresia died we can see actually now the Pinka synagogue together with the cemetery and on the other side you can see a little line which is uh, also new now. There's an exhibition about the journey without no return, which means that when people are going to see the memory of the Shoah, we thought that maybe it will be good to give them somehow the explanation because if you are coming from different countries, you don't know if it's all the victims or the victim just from my country. So my colleague make uh, incredible 
exhibition uh, about the history of the Shoah in my country, and she used amazing images, actually, which was founded in different archives in Berlin and others that we even didn't know that, uh, for example, the pictures of the Jews, they were deported from town Pozen, are based actually there. And this is the Spanish synagogue. You can see the beautiful colors of the and the Moorish design and uh, the actual renovating. It's also new in the way that the synagogue was built in 1868 and it's very big synagogue the first synagogue which was used the electricity and heating system but of course they knew that during the winter time less people are coming so there's a winter synagogue and in the winter synagogue now we have the history uh, from 1945 till 2021 so you can see some of the images we of course are trying to use as much also now the touch screens and other things that people can get more information we also have a lot of stories and interviews with the survivors there so it's kind of like an interactive new exhibition because of course we would like to also uh, see that young people are coming to see it and they are also interested in the past so it was briefly about the Jewish Museum in Prague, which has a very long history from 1906 till today. And I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you so much for your attention. OK, so um, we're going to have a look at um, some questions and I'm sure you also have some questions that you'd like to uh, to give to to ask Susanna um, sorry I need to just open this a little bit wider here so that I can see but in the meantime do we, do we have any questions from the floor anybody who would like to know something so Hold on, Linda, I will come there. This is a bit of a... Susanna, we spoke about that very, very moving memorial on the wall where all the names were written and painted so painstakingly by those artists. And then you see they were erased. Is that so? Were you able to get them back, maybe? Yeah, actually, yeah, actually uh, uh, the, names the names were erased, were erased uh, uh, after 1968, uh, probably when the, they decided that the synagogue will be closed for public. And after 1994, the first thing what the Jewish Museum did was to bring back the names on the walls. But actually, in 2000. Well, to, uh, 2002, actually, there was a big flood in Prague and all the old town was actually flooded and also the Pinka Synagogue. So it's three times rewriting of those names. But uh, it's still in process because, like I said, like at the time, we got the names from the transport list. In 1997, the book of Terezin was published with all the names and we started to be part of the database of Yad Vashem. But actually last year we added other names. There's an additional part because we realized that, uh, and we know of course that some of the people decided to commit suicide before uh, to be, because when they got the report that they will be deported, they just decided that they will not go. And uh, they were mentioned on the list, but we didn't know what happened with them. And now we are trying to actually go over. And sometimes also people are coming and they are telling us the stories and we can add the name there because we know that the person didn't come back, but we didn't know that maybe the person escaped, something happened. But actually most of the names are the names of the people they committed suicide. Susanna, so, so one of the things that I noticed um, outside of Prague is that when you go to the cemeteries, um, you have on certain of the tombstones pictures of family members with their date of birth and date of death. When did, when did they start doing that? 
it's actually also after the Velvet Revolution, we have the new Jewish cemetery also in Prague. And if the family survived, they started to go to the cemetery when they have the grave and they started to put the names of the members of the family they lost. And you can do it all around outside Prague. They, we started also to put a Stolperstein for the people they used to live in the places and we know that this was the last address so you can actually you can also do it in Theresienstadt there was a cemetery which was used during the World War II and now there's one place that you can just come and you can put the name of the person you lost so this is of course something also new the people were not able to do it before everything started right after the Velvet Revolution and sometimes you can see that the names are written in English because some of the f members of the family left and they started to live in different places and the kids grew up in completely different place with different language and then they came to Prague and they founded the original tomb and they wrote it down in memory or in loving memory of our family and they wrote the members. Okay, so then we have um Sorry, so we, know we have some questions um, um, from an anonymous attendee. I seem to recall that the Pinkfishaw Memorial had to be done twice because of flood damage. So three Is times, true? actually three times, because when they wrote the names, then they have to erase them in 1968, then we did them again in 1994. Okay, so then it seems to be a problem that people can't actually hear um, my question. So if you could just repeat it for those who are online. Okay, so I repeat that uh, the Pinka Synagogue actually the we have to do it three times. It's three times rewriting of those names. First time they have to actually erase the names before 1968. Then in 1994, we made a memorial like new one. We put it the name again on the walls. But in 2002, the flood came and we have to do it again. So it's three times the writing of those names. Well, it's also important to say, like I said, we when they started to do it, they really used the transport list. So they used the day of birth they knew and they used the day of death, which was actually not the date of the death, but the date of the last transport. Today, because we are working together with other memorials like uh, auschwitz broken and uh, others, we can figure out sometimes in the exact date. But we decided to keep it like that, how actually Hanna Volavkova, Jiří Jon and Václav Boštík wanted in the beginning. So we don't want to change the dates uh, of that, actually. Okay, then we have a question from Bev Price. Um, how many individual items of silver Judaica make up the total museum's collections, excluding fabric and paper items? Uh, I think I will be not able to answer really the right numbers, but it's always over 100,000 items we have. 4,000 items of the curtains and all kind of the silver things. It's really like very huge collection, but I think, and I'm sorry that I don't know, know the exact numbers, if you will go to the page of the Jewish Museum in Prague, you can find really all the items, how many of them we have them in our collections. But I have to say, when we did the new exhibition in the Meiser Synagogue and in a Spanish Synagogue, it was so hard to pick something which will be unique. Because if you have one shield for the Torah scroll, it's easy. But if you have like hundreds of them, it's very hard to pick something which will be unique and which will tell the story. So that's why sometimes it's very hard to think about the objects. But we have few which are really, really beautiful. And of course, not all of them were in such a good shape. So what happened after 1994, we have a special places that we can actually focus on the paper, books, silver, and of course people are still working with these objects. Because the communists didn't sell them, but they didn't pretend them and they didn't renovate them. The only thing which was sell during the communist time was actually more than 300 Torah scrolls 
and they were sold to England. And there's a special organization, the Memorial Scroll Trust, and they actually renovated all the Torah scrolls. And then they said that they will use them for the other communities in all around the world. So some of the Torah scrolls are actually now in the United States, in different places, and people can use them. But all the Torah scrolls belong to the Memorial Scroll Trust in England. Okay, there's another question from somebody. Can you give examples of common Czech Jewish surnames? Actually, it's a, it's a very interesting question because there is not common Czech Jewish surname because in the 1800, when Joseph II decided to open the gates of the ghetto, he said few things. One thing was that Jews were, actually they have to use German as a language of the community in the public places and they have to change their names from the Hebrew to German, which means that some of the Jews took the name from the places they used to live. So if someone lived in Brandis, they became family Brandis. If someone lived in the town Rosenberg, they became family Rosenberg. If someone lived in Liban, in Prague, became Liban. So one way was to have the name uh, after the places they used to live. The second way was to take the name from the German word. So we have a lot of like uh, Zilberman. There was a famous art, actually, uh, artist from a famous man from Trozin Ghetto, Schulhof Erwin. We have like a Felsenberg. And we have also like uh, names like Goldschmidt, Zilberman, etc. So I think there's no common Czech Jewish name because all the Jews in Europe have to change from the Hebrew to German. But of course, Kafka, for example, Franz Kafka, very famous writer, he had a typical Czech name because his father was Czech Jew, the mother was from the German side. And Kafka, it's a name of the birth, but it's written with we, and because the pronunciation in German, it's F, it's Franz Kafka. So, but the typical name of the, it doesn't exist something like that, because I think all the Jews, they got the names in the 1800 in Europe, and they are all the same. Okay, another question. When I toured to Raisin, the guide said that Hitler had a special affinity for the city of Prague. Is that true? Uh, it's also complicated because uh, there was a lot of rumors about Prague and about the Jewish Museum in Prague, actually. There were some people, they were saying that Hitler wanted to have in Prague a museum of that race to show the culture with other people. But there is nothing which we can actually say and prove because the Nazis were very organized and it's uh, very actually hard to believe that they will not write something about this idea. So I'm always saying that we have to be very careful with this because we don't know if this was true or not. And many survivors actually were saying that they actually thought that this was the reason why everything was actually kept in Prague. But it was, it's really hard to say. It's, uh, it's, I can't answer that this is really true or not. Okay, can you say anything about the pre-Holocaust turn of Jewish community in the Northeast? Uh, Pre-war? Okay. Pre-Holocaust turn of Jewish community in the Northeast? Actually, in the former Sudetenland, probably. Because it's also interesting that uh, actually after the Munich Accord, we lost this part of the country. And of course, the Jews, they lived there. They have to move to the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. But some of them succeeded uh, to escape because they knew what was happening. And they just said, we are leaving. So some of them actually survived because they really just got the chance and they left. After the World War II, this area until today, it's a very complicated part of my history, of the history of my country, because of course it was not, they were Germans and when the liberation uh, actually happened, the Czech actually uh, did the same to the, what the Germans did before to them and to the Jews. So it's a very complicated part of the history. 
But what is very interesting, after the trials I was mentioning in 1952, the Jews, they actually were members of the families that some of the family was killed in this trial. They have to leave Prague and they were sent to this part of the area of the former Sudetenland. And that's why till today we have... M actually the communities we have still are in this area of the Sudetenland which is pretty strange because it's such a complicated part of the history of this area in the north. Okay, I think um, if I may just get to the front of the room. Susanna, I would like to say thank you um, from all of us sitting here, and on behalf of Tully Nates from the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center and Mary Cluck um, from the Durban Center, thank you so much for being with us, for sharing such wonderful um, information. For some people it may be new, those of us who have been to Prague, you've, you've almost brought back to life. And what we had visited, and I think it's uh, maybe time to have another visit because there's oh, certainly sure. more exhibitions. To all of you that came, thank you so much. To those that are watching online, thank you. Be safe, look after yourself, be healthy. For those educators that are watching, remember tomorrow morning we have a wonderful workshop for our educators and educational guides around the country. Um, starting at 10 o'clock. Those who haven't signed up, remember to do something and um, remember to do so. And Susanna, thank you so much. Thank you so much.